We're turning to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 4, and we'll begin our study there in verse 13. Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. After when affliction or persecution ariseth <clears throat> for the word's sake, <clears throat> excuse me, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. Mark chapter 4 begins with one of the most important of the some 39 parables that our Lord will give in his ministry. It's a wonderful Bible study just to study the parables of our Lord. I have preached a series through those. But he asked his, his disciples in verse 13, Do you not discern and understand this parable? How then will it be possible for you to discern and other, understand all other parables? The reason is because this parable describes the kingdom of God and who it is that is part of this kingdom. He mentions there in verse 11, He said unto them, and to, the, to you is the, given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Those who are outside the kingdom of God or without, they are the lost. Those that are within are the truly saved. The kingdom of God, that phrase, describes what God is doing on earth and in heaven at the, at the present. Our Lord tells us, and tells them, and he tells us, I will build my church. And that's what's going on. That's the kingdom of God. It's what is, he's doing at the present, building his church. We become a part of that kingdom, not by our physical birth, or by any racial delineation, but by our spiritual birth. That is the entrance into the kingdom of God. To Nicodemus, our Lord gave the imperative, you must be born again. And the kingdom of God will result ultimately in the return of Christ to earth at the end of the age for him to set up first his millennial kingdom and then the eternal day of the Lord. Revelation 20, verse 6, just a verse Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests, describing the saved. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And that's the future kingdom, but the kingdom of God is at the present being built in his church. In verse 11, he calls salvation the mystery of the kingdom of God. And you'll recall that in that interview with Nicodemus, our Lord likened the mystery of the new birth. It is mysterious in so many ways, but the work, because the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart, he describes it as the, the work of the wind. And remember that analogy he gave us, not only of the new birth, but he, he brings into the, the picture the, the wind. We see the effects of the wind, but nobody can see wind. It is invisible. You can't literally see the wind, you can see the effects, you can see the limbs of the leaves moving in the wind, but you don't see the wind itself or, or where it even comes from, its origin. Likewise, the work of generation within a mother's womb is mysterious and largely hidden and unseen. Eventually, though, the work of generation is obvious in the birth of a baby. A baby comes forth. And it is the obvious work of that private and mysterious work that has been going on for some while within the mother. There are obvious signs, and eventually a, a live baby is seen and felt and observed. So is the new birth, the spiritual birth. In regeneration, he uses that same word, being born again, regeneration. The rebirth, the Spirit of God plants 
the seed of the word of God within the heart. This is the means by which we're born again. 1 Peter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed or sinful seed as we're born physically, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass, but the grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord, that's where our salvation is based, that's how we've been born again, it abideth forever, it endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. What is that the sower sows? What is it? Well, he tells us there, the sower sows the word of God. The farmer plants seed, doesn't he? He plants exactly what he wants to see grow up. And what is it that the Holy Spirit sows in the heart and to cause regeneration? The incorruptible seed of the Word of God. Now, those of us who teach and preach, you parents, all of us as believers who are to witness, we have one seed that we use to, in, the, the preaching of the, in the teaching of the gospel. It is the Word of God. It's not other things. Romans 10 describes it. You know those familiar verses. Verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. How then shall they call on him, in verse 14, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? So then faith cometh by hearing in hearing by the Word of God. It is the Word, the Word of God is the seed by which we're regenerated. And this parable before us describes all of this. If we do not understand what is taught in this parable, we cannot understand the, the mystery of the church, the mystery of salvation, what it means to be saved, what the kingdom of God is all about. And so this parable describes it for us. And like their Lord, the apostles and us are to be we're commissioned to preach the gospel to every creature, to go into all the world, not only to preach the gospel to them, but see conversions and baptize them and teach them all things that he's taught us. The reason we never get that far with so, some so-called converts is given to us here. And if you don't understand these things, you'll become very discouraged in the work of the Lord, the work of the ministry, because you'll see these various kinds of results or lack of them, and wonder what's wrong with me, what's wrong with our church, what's wrong with our pastor, and begin to show blame and to point fingers, and we need to ramp it up, we need to get a new program or start doing something new to draw people in. And we see the church all around us uh, because they do not understand the Lord's work, and they begin to do all kinds of things that we see before us today. The sower sows the word. That's quite simple, quite plain. And if the sower sows the word, and here the sower is the Lord, and then it will be all those who represent him, the sower sows the word, and so must we. Not philosophy, not uh, opinion, or entertainment, or what people want to hear, or uh, you know, think tanks, or support groups as such. I'm not saying a support group is not good in some areas, but that's not sowing the seed. The sowing of the seed of the Word of God is what the sower sows. And it's simply the Word. And you'll notice that all these various types of hearers, they all had one thing in common. They heard the Word of God. Verse 15 tells us, When they heard, the Word was sown, planted in their hearts. The various souls are the various types of hearts that we're going to look at in just a moment are the various kinds of hearers that hear the Word. Verse 20 speaks of receiving the Word. In First John, or John, the Gospel of John 1, verse 12, to as many as received him. So what does that receiving mean? To as many as received him, to them gave he the power, that regenerating power, regenerating power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 20 speaks of bringing forth fruit. So here we have the pattern of salvation. There must be hearing of the word. There must be receiving that word. And then the obvious result of that hearing and receiving will be fruit bearing. If all these things are not in place, you do not have genuine conversion. The standard of true regeneration, of truly being born again, is one that our Lord gave. And is the universal standard. And it is this, lasting fruit. 
there will be fruit where there is spiritual life. And if there is no spiritual fruit, we must deduct that there's no spiritual life. This is, this is not judging. This is the standard our Lord gave us. Judging is examining or thinking that you know what somebody's motives are. We cannot judge motives or what's going on in the heart. But all of us can examine and see what fruit is. And, and spiritual people know what spiritual fruit is. Matthew 7, he tells us, By their fruits ye shall, plural, you shall know them. Now, how would the disciples know, and how would we as followers of Christ in this century, in this day, how would we know that the, the crowds, remember the crowds are pressing our, our Lord. He is speaking from a boat because he cannot, that would actually physically crush him. And so he had to distance himself and get in the boat. How would he and his disciples know what all those people were there for? What, what are their spiritual status? There are masses of people. How will they know that the ones who are true, that the, that the professors were truly possessors of salvation? One standard, one standard only. It is the only standard given to us in the scripture. It is fruit, some measurable fruit, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And we'll see what that, those divisions and those percentages mean at the end of the, the message today. Our Lord gives four types of hearts here, or souls. And we'll begin there in verse 4. The first one, the hard heart. He mentions it back in verse 4. It came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And then in verse 15, And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately. He wastes no time. He's at every gospel meeting. He's, at, he's wherever the word of God is being spoken, uh, one of his emissaries, and he wastes no time. Immediately, we lollygag and drag our feet and pray over it and have prayer meetings and commissions and meetings and seminars, but Satan does none of that. He gets right at it. He wastes no time. He cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, this is the hard, this hard heart is the hard, unplowed dirt that lay on top of the paths throughout the countryside. In the South, some of us remember that many of the county roads now that are paved, I remember as a boy, when they were simply hard-packed or gravel roads. And I can hear those, the sound of the tire on those gravel roads out in the country where our people came from. There were very few uh, paved roads out in Greene County and areas where the lambs were from. And they would, the seed on the wayside on the hard side of those paths is what he's talking about there. These hearers have hardened or calloused hearts. Calloused by their refusal to believe. They've made up their minds. They have it figured out. They know what they think. The seed does not penetrate this barrier of hardness. As one commentator has noted, the same sun that gives life to the seed planted in the good soil hardens the clay of unbelief in the hearts of these rejectors. The reason such people fail to receive the gospel is not due to any deficiency in the skill of the sower. It is not the sower's fault, the preacher's fault, the Sunday school teacher's fault. It is not that the personality was not good enough or they didn't have enough classes and in fact, Satan gives lockjaw to so many of God's people because they feel like they're not a professional giver out of the word, which nobody's required to be. We're just told to give it, to preach it, to tell it, to testify. It's the power, is the seed, it's not you. Now, we should have a clean life and a, a pure heart and right motive, but again, the Lord can use all manner of people and things to get his gospel out. So it's not in the, the skill. Please, away with that. That keeps so many of God's people not witnessing. It is not your skill. What is skill anyway? You don't impress a hard-hearted sinner with your entertainment or your sophistry or your intelligence. You only impress yourself. They're sinners. They've seen it all. 
Oh, they're so religious. They think they've got it figured out. It is not, the, the, the reason people fail to believe, receive the gospel is not due to the deficiency in either the skill of the sower or of the power of the seed, but rather to their own willful unbelief. Having continually resisted the truth about Christ, their hearts have become hard like pavement. And so we see this, this so callous that are they that so often they've resisted the truth that Satan comes like a hungry bird and just gobbles it up, snatches it away as it is sown in their hearts. He, he would do that in the heart of every hearer if he could. The reason he can't is because of the different soul, the different condition of the heart. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 explains it. But if our gospel be hid or blinded or veiled off if our gospel be hid it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world and that's Satan hath blinded the minds the mind is part of the heart it's part of the inner man it's part of, the mind must understand these facts so you cannot dissect the mind from the heart and the soul it's all part of the inner man and part of this mysterious work that we're describing you, there's no surgeon, there's no spiritual surgeon, there's no laser that can dissect the mind from the heart and the will and the emotions. It's all part of the inner man. But he has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan will use any means at all. He doesn't play by rules. He's not fair. He's ruthless. He's heartless. He's the enemy of your soul. He's the enemy of God. He will do anything and stop at nothing. We should never be surprised at the means that Satan goes through, goes to, to snatch away the preached, sown word. Religion, he'll use religion, denominationalism, cults. He'll use the fear of man. He'll use false preachers disguising themselves as angels of light. We could go on and on and on. The list is endless of what he will do. He'll use his, most, his favorite tool, employ as works righteousness. That's his most favorite tool. The heart deceiving itself that it's okay. I'm just as good as you. Who do you think you are? And they believe they can work their way to, to heaven and that they're already righteous. They don't need anything. They're like the rich fool who doesn't feel like he needs anything. He's got it all figured out. Satan doesn't waste time. We do. The Bible over and over again tells us to walk circumspectly and to redeem the time because as God's people who ought to be the wisest people on earth, we waste so much time. Satan and his emissaries do not. Satan, we see here, comes immediately every time the gospel is preached. Every time someone goes out in evangelism. You just need to know that Satan is there to snatch if he can. That should not make us feel powerless or throw up our hands because there are various types of souls. You don't know what kind of soul that person has. They may put up an adamant hard front, but they're, they're cr cracking inside. The Holy Spirit's working in their heart. You don't know what's, what's going on. So we obviously see it after the fact, and we need to be aware of these kinds of souls, but that should not deter us in being wit uh, wit witnessing from the gospel. So then there is the shallow heart in verses 5 and 6. Some fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And then look in verse 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on the stony ground, who when they heard the word immediately, oh, they receive it with gladness. They're excited. They're, they're there at the next service. They have no root in themselves, though, and so endure but for a time. After when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now here is a superficial and sometimes seemingly an, an immediate and positive response. And we just rejoice. We're so happy. They seem to have received it. And they join the church, maybe. They, they love it all. And they're eating it up. I mean, they are in the midst of it all. But then quickly, this quickly sprouted seed dies away. And we wonder, what's wrong? What happened? What did I say? What did I do? That kind of thing. Again, as one commentator noted, the, soul, the stony soul then re represents people who, in spite of their initial excitement, ultimately they reject the gospel. 
because their faith is not genuine. Jesus compared them in a similar way to those described by the roadside soil. The only difference is that their hard-heartedness is not initially apparent, being buried beneath the surface, but, it, but at some point and soon they fall away. Their initial response may be emotional and even dramatic. It may be at a crisis time of their life. Or they may be something they hear in a service or in your presentation of the gospel strikes a chord from, from, their play, from their youth or from their mother or their grandmother influence or something. This is this emotional element or the song or the situation or maybe even the message was so moving they just you know, make a profession of faith. And from the outside, it appears to be real and genuine faith and true conversion and what looks like fruit. The thing about spiritual fruit, it will show itself and it will be a lasting spiritual fruit. And while the feelings were stirred and causing outward and hopeful signs of fruit, it was not real because their hearts were not really regenerated or transformed. The fault is not, again, with the preacher, it is not with the teacher, it's not with the presenter of the gospel. The problem is not the word. It, it is the incorruptible seed of the word of God. There is nothing faulty about any verse. You can, people have been saved by some of the, um, what we would consider the most unusual verses. It is the power of God's word. I've shared with you A.W. Pink, the renowned expositor. He was raised in a godly home. He got into spiritualism, the occult, and seances and all that. It just broke his parents' heart. As a young man, he came in one night from, from a seance or they were trying to levitate someone or something just off the wall. His father was weeping when he came in and he said, you know, Arthur, he said, the way of the transgressor is hard. And then he quoted, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. He said he went up to his room and closed the door and could not come out for days. The Holy Spirit took that seed, that word, and compounded with all that he had heard. He'd heard the gospel and brought him to repentance and faith. The power is the word of God. I'm sure that his father that night didn't realize that would be the key. That would be the verse. That would be the presentation that would ultimately bring him to, to repentance and faith. So please note, the problem is not with giving the gospel or how you gave it. The problem is not with the, the, the verse you used. It's good to use gospel verses, but it is all the word of God, okay? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Can pierce and divide asunder. The, it, the only thing that can dissect the soul is this book, and it can do that. To, to separate the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is the power of God unto salvation. Nothing else is. This is. Okay? It's the only seed that we use. It's the only tool that we use. Nothing else. When application, or excuse me, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, they go home and say, honey, I've, I've joined the church or I've come to faith in Christ or however they do it. And then that rejection comes or their parents disown them. Or immediately they are offended. That word offense means a stumbling block. It causes them to fall. A stumbling block trips you. And that's what he says. They, they immediately heard the word and they, they, they fall away. They are offended by it. They've, they've heard it with gladness. Look at verse 17. But immediately the affliction for the, for the word of God say they become offended. They fall away. They, it becomes a stumbling block to them. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. But they're truly born again, truly regenerated. Nothing can make us fall away. Now, they get their feelings hurt. They're rejected because of their new profession of faith. And I say profession. It's not a regeneration. It may look like it. It seemed like it. And we, you know, they, they come along for a while, but they, they throw in the towel. He that loveth our Lord gave us this severe warning that's why he that loveth houses or lands or mother and father more than me is not worthy to be my disciple that's what they're speaking of because their faith in christ lacks a genuine sorrow over sin a sincere repentance a heartfelt hunger for righteousness a deep love for the savior it is never really truly taken root inevitably when the going gets tough and let's all face it the going gets tough 
immediately, even when there's a true profession of faith, Satan pounces on that new convert with all fours and will do anything he can to discourage. When that comes, the going gets tough. They abandon their superficial commitment to the Lord. True believers, by contrast, possess a faith that nobody can shake them from. It doesn't matter if their parents disown them or their loved ones leave them or they lose their job. They found Christ, the pearl of great price. Nothing else matters. They will sell everything for that pearl. And even martyrdom. Study. You need to read Fox's book of martyrs again if you've never read it. Those martyrs who sang their way into the fire, the fire they are preached as they were sawing their arms off. You can't take away genuine salvation from, from someone. And then we see there's a third type of soul or heart or hearer, the crowded heart. Look in verse 7. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no fruit. In verse 18, and we're talking about the fruit of conversion, not spiritual fruit after conversion, but the, the genuine fruit of repentance and faith. In verse 18, and these are they which are sown among the, the thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. It does not yield the fruit of regeneration. This is the worldly, thorny, crowded heart. And again, the seed is sown. It seems to take root to the soul winner, the teacher, the pastor. There seems to be signs there. They're coming along. They seem to be in the faith. And just when it does, thorns choke it to death. The thorn there is acantha. And it was a common thorny bramble throughout all of Israel. All of our Lord's hearers knew exactly what he was talking about. Wherever you had a garden, you had to deal with these, this, this acantha. And it's the same word used, by the way, in Matthew 27, verse 29, for the crown of thorns. The worries, the fears of life. Remember, perfect love casteth out fear. God does not give the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Who then does? Satan does. He loves fear. It's so powerful, isn't it? And so this fear of man that bringeth a snare, the fear of the what if, the fear if I lose my job, I can't, I can't go along with this. I'll lose my marriage. I'll lose my job. And the, the, the worries of life, the fears of life, the lure maybe of deceitfulness of riches. The boss comes in and says, well, I was just about to promote you and make you manager. If you do this crazy religious stuff, I'm, I'm not going to put, put up with that. We, we think of the rich young ruler. When faced with Christ or of his possessions, he couldn't. He could not part with his possessions for Christ. He seemed so interested, so sincere, so moral. One old preacher said anybody would want the rich young ruler in their church. He was a young man with a lot of money, sincere, wanting to do the work of the Lord. And he just, and then the Lord said, well, go sell all that and then come back and talk to me. He couldn't do it. The deceitfulness of riches, the desire of other things or people above Christ comes in and it chokes out the gospel. These are the double-minded that James talks about, the double-souled. There is no such thing as a double-minded Christian, a double-souled Christian. Our Lord tells us it's an impossibility. One of the proofs of true conversion is single-mindedness about Christ. There are those, however, who think they can have it both ways. They think that they can serve God and mammon, they can straddle the fence, that they can be on the broad road and the narrow road at the same time. It's a dichotomy that cannot be. It's the faith often of celebrities, the closest I can put it. Those who, you know, the rich and the famous whose lives show no change, they haunt, go to the same haunts, they, they stay in the same honky-tonks, they don't come out of the, the, the filthy world that they're in, but they profess Christ, and they feel like they can have it both ways. And the Lord says you cannot. And they, though they're preoccupied with the world and their image and the, their, their things, 
And Christ says, you cannot, look, well, listen to what our Lord said, to that kind of Christianity. And we see it, it's very common today. It's the designer, glitter, glittering, rich and famous. Again, I'm not saying stars can't get saved or athletes are rich and famous people. It's those whose lifestyles do not change. They still are on the same road, espousing the same thing, still in the same love scenes in the R-rated movies, and yet they profess to know Christ. That their, their profession is a false one. It's an empty one. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on, upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then he went on in that same portion of Scripture, says you cannot serve God and fill in the blank. God in anything. Mammon is a catch-all phrase that means money, whatever else. You cannot serve God and mammon, for you will love the, hate one and love the other, or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and. And there he says mammon. Well, that's those who are on the thorny ground. The thorns, all these things just choke out the profession of faith, and it is not complete it's not real it's aborted we might say lastly there is the fruitful heart and so let's look and see what that looks like this is the one we want to see we want our heart to be that and we certainly look for that in the lives of those who make a profession of faith as your pastor one of my duties and the leadership of our church is to interview people to examine their profession of faith before we admit them into church membership i don't have a crystal ball i can't look in people's hearts what then, as a physician of the soul, what do we look for? What is the testimony? Anybody can testify and say anything. How then can we be assured of a person's profession of faith that it is true possession of faith? Well, lastly, we see the fruitful heart. Look there in verse 8. Other fell on. What is the difference here? What is the difference in all this? It's not the seed, is it? The seed is the same. It's the condition of the heart. Good ground good soul rich soul other fell on good ground and did yield what fruit that is the standard that is the sign that sprang up and increased it didn't just spring up it kept on growing until it produced godly fruit it endured it persevered these are the signs of the truly regenerate it sprang up but it didn't just spring up some of the others sprang up and gave some initial evidences it sprang up it did yield fruit that did in front of the yield means it absolutely gave forth spiritual fruit measurable seen obvious spiritual fruit and increased and brought forth some and some 30 some 60 and some and hundred and then looking down in verse 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground, the good soil, such as hear the word, remember the conditions of repentance and faith, they hear the word of God, they hear the gospel, they receive it, whatever Christ says, they receive it. If he said to stand on their heads, they would stand on their heads. They receive Christ and all that he is, all that he professes to be, all that he requires. Whatever you tell me about Christ, tell me more, they receive it. He's the only way. All right, I, I receive that. He's the door. If by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. That's the door I'm going through. I want Christ. I want, all other ground is sinking sand. So they receive it, and, and then it says, he says it brings forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. Now, what is the difference? I know we're dying to know, Brother Lamb, I want to be a good Sunday school teacher. I want to be an effective witnesser. I'm, I'm examining the fruit. I, you have young children coming along. You have children who've not made a profession of faith in your, in your home. And so you're concerned about that. All of us are concerned about this. In fact, the Bible says, examine yourselves to see if you be in the faith. Their hearts have been prepared by the Word of God. The good soul is a supernatural Holy Spirit preparation to receive the Word of God. And, and if you say, what can we do? We ought to always pray before every service, before every Sunday school lesson. Lord, prepare the hearts of the hearers that it will be rich soul, soft soul. And use the circumstances, the events in their life this week, today, 
things, maybe even worries or fears, to prepare their hearts. As a young boy, my father had passed away. He died just a month before I heard the gospel. My heart was very tender. I was, I was a mess and didn't know, you know, I was going through all kinds of 15-year-old boys searching. And that was part of what the Lord used for me to be receptive to the gospel. We should pray that God will use those things and prepare. Only God can prepare the hearts for those that are going to hear the word of God. And that's why we should pray on, when the evangelism Sunday, when they go out, that the, the hearts will be prepared. Lydia's heart was what? It was opened. She was at a prayer meeting, but she wasn't saved. The Holy Spirit opened her heart. We should pray for opened hearts, hearts that are receptive, hearts that are soft, so the difference in all of these hearers was this, the condition of the soul. Now, ultimately, the Lord is the only one that can do that. John 6, verse 44, our Lord said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Lord, draw people to yourselves. We pray that every service, every time the gospel is preached. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, the apostle said, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, when you heard our preaching, Paul said, when I came to Thessalonica and you heard me preach the word of God, you received it not as the word of man. Not just that's Brother Lamb's opinion, but the Sunday school class's opinion. Not just that teacher. You received it not as my word, but as the word. The word of men, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word of God is effectual. The calling is effectual. God must be at work. We must pray that the Spirit of God prepare hearts. Now, do you not believe wherever the gospel is preached, there are these various souls? On this Lord's Day morning, and we will pre present the Word of God in Sunday school and in the gospel preaching service. They are always hearing various hearers, or, or very well, maybe. And at the same time, we pray that, oh, Lord, may someone, whatever they go through this week, maybe they were fired at work and say, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go. Glen Iris right there on the corner. I'm going to go. I need to hear something. Whatever the reason that brought them here, Lord, use it as a plow to plow their heart and make it soft. Bring them to the place of repentance. In John 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear fruit, but without me, you can do nothing. Fruit is the ultimate indication of true salvation. We produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Matthew 3 verse 8 says, the fruit of righteousness, Philippians 1 verse 1. The fruit of the Spirit, that fruit that we most often refer to, love, joy, peace, temperance, and kindness, those, the, the gentleness, the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in a redeemed heart. As one commentator noted, Jesus often included a surprising element in his parables. The harvest he describes here of 30, 60, and 100 fold went far beyond anything those farmers in his audience had ever experienced. Those figures represent yields of 3,000, 6,000, and 10,000 percent. Natural yields in that day were less than eightfold, and a crop that produced tenfold would have been considered extraordinary. Yet the fields of which Jesus speak were exponentially more productive when the gospel goes forth, empowered by the Spirit of God, the work, the, the result is supernatural. See how quickly the gospel spread? In a hundred years, it had spread throughout the known world. The preaching of the gospel so amazing and spread so rapidly throughout the empire, the Roman Empire, and throughout the world. We're called to give the seed of the gospel to others. We all know that. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've said to you, that teaching, discipling ministry. They'll have to stay. They'll have to last long enough before they can be discipled. And so we pray. We're not to alter the seed so sadly today. People have watered down the gospel. They have call all kinds of things the gospel. 
How rarely do we hear that you're to repent of your sin, your sordid sin, and leave it off and receive the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, who alone is worthy to be worshipped, who died in your place by his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You must turn from your sin. You must forsake all others, all idols, everything that would stand between you. You're not worthy to be this disciple. He that would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. The purity of the gospel. We're not to alter the seed of the gospel. Yes, Christ, when someone says, maybe of another faith, and they say, well, what, what about my sincerity? What about my parents? What about You have to say, the gospel is, I am the door. Jesus I, is the way, the truth, and the life. No other, you know, no one can come to the Father but by me. The exclusivity of the gospel. We must not trim it. We must not water it down. We must not make it palatable, palatable to the people that are listening. Uh, you know, appetizing. We're not to to cram it down their throats through entertainment or sleight of hand or you know. So much of what we see is that it's through the back door. It's not an open public presentation of Christ alone as the Savior. But we're to faithfully and consistently give it out. We realize there will be mixed, often unsettling results. I will tell you, in my ministry, in these years of preaching and teaching and doing the work of the ministry, at times you say, Lord, there's so, so little fruit. Isaiah said, they have not all heard. They've not, they've not heard me. This is not our business. That's not your business whatsoever. Lasting fruit, though, will be the sign of genuine conversion. It is comforting to know that these things, and we can go and we can pray and trust Him with the results. It really is, is releasing and freeing to know that my responsibility is to be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within me, to tell people about the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the horribleness of sin, that they have sinned and broken the law of God. And the, the penalty for that is eternal separation from God. that must be paid eternally. Or you can turn to the penalty that was paid for us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive His work on the cross. Receive it all as your own and in your stead and believe that word. Simply receive it and believe it, turning from your sin, and He will save you. That is our responsibility the seed is not to be altered. The message is clear and plain. Do not be intimidated for not knowing all the doctrines of the Bible. Who said you had to know all the doctrines of the Bible? Did you know them all to be saved? No. You didn't know your right hand from your left. You didn't know the books of the Bible. All that. Don't, don't be intimidated. I hear so many people say, well, Pastor, I just don't know what to say. To so say you're a sinner, you need to be saved. You know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is the power of the gospel and of a, a life lived before its sincerity and to give it out. And we can trust the Lord with the results. We won't know until we stand before him what really, ultimately, what is true and lasting. But uh, this ought to be encouraging. It ought to clarify some of what we see. And do not let Satan discourage you, but it should move us to pray fervently. What are we to do then? We're to give out the gospel, and we're to pray fervently for prepared hearts to receive it, which is the Lord's business. Now, the Lord designed this. He could have done it a different way. The means of getting the gospel is the preaching. That's done one-on-one -on -one or uh, allowed like I'm doing here. We say preaching for any witnessing is preaching. It's heralding, it's announcing, it's telling what Christ has done. And that's all of our responsibility, the results we live in such a result-oriented. This is not a sales pitch. This is not that kind of thing. And so often, so winning and witnessing is just, you know, check it off the list, push them, make them pray, sign their name on a card. That's not genuine New Testament gospel work. And we must be patient. We must be everlastingly at it and leave the results to Him. Well, the Lord bless his word. We believe the gospel and the power of the Lord to, to save the lost.